everybody for coming to our IHPI seminar this afternoon. Um, my name is Sarah Hawley. I'm the faculty lead for education and training uh, for those who don't know me. Um, and I'm really excited um, to present one of our education and training work group members to present today. Um, we have Dr. Joel Gagné. Um, he is a clinical epidemiologist and associate professor in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery and Epidemiology here at the University of Michigan. His research program focuses on clinical and methodological research related to musculoskeletal conditions and clinical care. He has a lot of publications in this space, um, some book chapters, and has given many presentations about this topic as well. And we're really excited to have Joel presenting today about something that I think we're all really interested in and, and many of us um, struggle with in our own research, which is patient reported outcome measures in clinical research and healthcare. Um, just a couple housekeeping things, please mute um, while you're not uh, speaking, obviously, and uh, put any questions into the chat and I will monitor those. Um, we'll, we'll have a question and answer discussion with Dr. Gagne at the end. Um, and then we'll also have our breakout room uh, opportunity at the end from five o'clock to 510. Um, we did this uh, recently and we had some really good engagement. So we're going to try it again. So please just stay on and uh, Stacy from IHPI will put you into a breakout room and just to chat with other members briefly at the end of the seminar today. Um, I'm gonna ask Stacy if she'll also put in the Twitter information in the chat for those of you who may want to share out um, some of the information from the presentation today. And with that, Dr. Gagne, thank you so much, please. Thanks very much, Dr. Harley, and thank you to uh, all the folks at IHPI <clears throat> for all their, their work over the years and supporting uh, our education and research and, and training. Um, you know, as Dr. Holly said, I'm a clinical epidemiologist <clears throat> in a uh, surgical department. Um, so I do, you know, I do outcomes research primarily. So, and I was involved in patient reported outcomes the sort of very early on in my undergraduate career as a in, 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 in psychology and kind of focusing in clinical psychology. It was my intent to do a PhD in clinical psychology, which didn't, didn't happen. I went a different route, but we, you know, we called them self-report measures back then. Um, so the whole field derives from, you, you'll hear me use the term psychometrics, the whole field of using patient reported outcome measures derives from the field of psychology and education. Um, so we'll be talking a lot about sort of how we, what, what these are, how you assess them, how you choose them, how they're potentially useful in clinical practice. And, and then there, I'm going to focus also on the, the sort of questions, the gaps in the literature where, where more research needs to be done. And I uh, hope some of you will um, do some of that in your own respective fields. <clears throat> Um, some disclosures, just let me know if you can't, if for some reason my slides aren't advancing. I was having some issues earlier. I think it's working now. Um, I never know whether I need to submit my disclosures. Somebody told me a couple of days ago that I'm supposed to, so I am. So I do a little bit of consulting and I have funding from these, uh, these funding bodies. Um, and, and some of the funding is directly related to patient report outcomes, but the consulting is not. So we're going to talk about health measurement. Um, why we care about patient report outcomes all in the first place. Um, um, what are measurement properties? These, you have to know about these things if you're gonna choose them for clinical research or you're gonna use them in, in, in clinical care and monitoring patients. patients. Um, how do problems maybe influence clinical practice or how they could and um, choosing them, how you choose them, where you're gonna find them, what criteria maybe you can use. And then a little bit about delivering patient portal outcome measures in um, you know, modern current day healthcare. So <clears throat> this whole field, PROs is under this whole field called health measurement. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So we, we obviously we need tools to assess the patient's state. And it could be really anything. It depends on your question, depends on your field. For you know, for me, for us in, in orthopedic surgery, it's obviously things like physical function, but it's also psychosocial function. Maybe it's other aspects um, in terms of you know more discrete aspects like specifically pain associated with one joint. Uh, maybe it's uh, sleep habits, um, or it's other things like you know uh, uh, blood pressure. Patient report outcomes are one such tool to measure states or phenomena in our patients uh, that can be repeated over time. So what 
patient report outcomes are is they collect information on constructs that are reported by the patients themselves, obviously, without interpretation by other parties. Now that's the big deal. Now there's a bit of a caveat there because obviously there, there may be in a variety of circumstances um, where there needs to be a caregiver, a parent, et cetera, to be able to help to fill this out. Maybe if there's um, 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 maybe if there's reading difficulties or if they're of a certain you know, age um, and are having issues with the filling it out. So nonetheless, it's still ide the idea is the constructs are being expressed by the person themselves. So this includes perceptions, opinions on symptoms of health-related quality of life, satisfaction, et cetera. Why, do we, why are we using them at all? I mean, I think it, it's fairly obvious, intuitive for everybody here why we're using PROMS right now. <clears throat> um, but it wasn't always necessarily the case. <laughs> we, um, it's obvious that the patient perspective on their health is of primary importance. And PROMS are increasingly being used to inform clinical decision-making, clinical practice guidelines, um, patient-centered care, precision medicine as a part of this. Um, health policy, and more recently, reimbursement decisions um, to healthcare organizations like ours. There's many organizations that are recommending patient report outcome measures be used routinely, such as CMS, uh, CMS, excuse me, the National Quality Forum, the FDA, um, National Committee for Quality Assurance, etc. cetera. Um, but the caveat is, is that, you know, just because a, a patient reported outcome is being used in your field and you see it frequently in publications, it doesn't mean it's the right one necessarily to use, even if you think it covers the concept that you're trying to measure in your patients or the construct, I guess. The reason for this is that the evidence and the preliminary evidence so far suggests the use of poor patient protocol outcome measures biases treatment effect estimates. That is, it gives you treatment effect estimates that are not valid. And we, so we need psychometric evidence of them. And very, most patient protocol outcome measures require additional work on them. Um, not all, I mean, there's some that have, have had a lot of work on them. I'm going to point out a paper that we published, a colleague and I published, I should have updated this. This has been published in the Journal of Clinical Epidemiology. It was published in, uh, I think it was published in late 2019 or early 2020. Nonetheless, um, if you search my name in PubMed and look for bias arising for patient protocol measures, you'll see it. We want, I wanted to figure out, because we were doing a bunch of work in, you know, using PROMs in patients with rotator cuff disease amongst other areas, but that was primarily where, what it was working in at the time. So what we wanted to find out was um, um, if poor patient reported outcome measures bias treatment effect estimates. So we took an area that we knew a lot about and we did this five-step process. We identified um, the outcome measures, patient reported outcome measures used in rotator cuff disease and assessed their psychometric quality. So they got a point score um, on some recognized criteria for assessing the, um, uh, the quality of the evidence and the uh, essentially well, globally how good the outcome measures are. They got, so they got a score. Um, we then identified randomized control trials in patients with randomized control trials that use these patient reported outcome measures from step one. We extracted outcomes associated with those problems only and then we standardized the findings um, because sometimes the PROs um, were, well, frequently they were different. There's many PROs that are used to measure rotator cuff disease um, following any type of intervention. So we standardized them. And there's a variety of ways to do that. I can explain it more later if you want to hear about it. We then extracted additional data from each study, such as the risk of bias of the randomized control trials themselves, how well they were done. And then we did some statistical analysis. So what did we find? We included 72 randomized trials on 174 separate outcomes that used only the PROs that we had psychometric evidence on and we had a score for. So the primary outcome that we used was the difference between the interventions. Um, the sample size on average was about 67 patients. Um, the standardized treatment effect mean, which doesn't mean a whole lot here, um, but that, that's what it was. Um, because like I said, it was standardized across the outcome measures. And the risk of bias score, th these studies on average got about a seven out of 10. So they were really pretty good actually. I was quite surprised that they were as good as they were. And so then we did a regression model where we took the, the psychometric summary score along the x-axis here. So it could, they can go into the minuses. So they all start at zero and they go up or they go down. <clears throat> and very few of these measures get really good scores. Most of them are kind of on the low end. And then here's the standardized treatment effect estimate for all of these studies. And here's the regression line. Even though that regression line looks slightly flat, it's actually not, it's statistically significant. That is, as you get better patient reported outcome measures, the treatment effect estimate on average is slightly lower 
than those studies that have PROs that are poor, that have poor properties to them. So this is a giant deal um, because there's many outcome measures that are being used just because it's routine. So what we found is, is that PROs with poor or unknown psychometric properties significantly bias, in this case, inflate effect estimates in clinical trials of rotator cuff disease by close to 67%, which is really large. Um, this, that's as big as unblinding a randomized trial. To our knowledge, that this is first, well, I'm going to need to say to our knowledge, is definitely the first empirical evidence that variations in psychometric quality for promise bias treatment effect estimates. So we have to be really careful how we choose PROs. But I want to, to highlight that to underscore our need to be really careful about how we choose PROs and to make sure that all of you, um, you know, really think hard about these, these various characteristics of the studies that are telling us how good PROs are or are not. So when you're choosing pros or proms, um, of course they have to be appropriate for your patient group. There's disease specific. So say specifically for rotator cuff disease, there's um, more generic quality of life outcome measures, say the SF36 is a good example, or the Promise Global Health Instrument. Um, and there's regional uh, measures as well too. For example, there's an American Shoulder and Elbow Society Index, which is for any conditions of the shoulder and elbow. Uh, so it's more of a more of a global, not specific, anatomically specific outcome measure. And then what domains or constructs are you interested in? So these are things like, you know, function, return to sport, well-being, et cetera. And they have to have good properties. I mean, you're gonna hear me say this a bunch. And just because they use a lot doesn't make sure it doesn't mean they're good. So the general, the general classes of properties you need to be aware of are validity, reliability, and responsiveness. And we could probably throw in an interpretability there too, which I'm which I will talk about. Validity is the idea that a measurement tool actually measures what it proposes to measure. If it says it's measuring physical function, it should actually be measuring physical function, not some other unrelated characteristic or phenomenon. And reliability is the property that it does so in a predictable manner, so it's repeatable. And then responsiveness is, is that the um, PRO is, a, is able to detect change in the construct that it's measuring. So if patients get, say, surgery for a rotator cuff tear, that after surgery, if the patient is, say, globally reporting that they're improving, that the PRO should also, also show that they're improving in physical function, activities of daily living, et cetera. And lastly, you have to be able to use it. We really have to think about test burden and the format, you know, giving, <clears throat> giving our patients, um, you know, a, a slew or a battery of PROs that have, you know, 300 items is just not doable. We have to really think carefully about the, uh, the outcome measures that we're using and what context um, in, are they able to be used by the patient population that we want to give them to. Here's um, a <clears throat> image from the Cosman group um, that I did some research with. Um, I'll, I'll discuss them a little bit too. That just shows basically the different types of reliability, internal consistency, inter-rater, intra-rater, um, uh, test retest, so measurement error, and then in the validity, you got content validity, construct validity, criteria validity, and there's all kinds of sub validity criteria, um, and then responsiveness and then interpretability. So interpretability means that, um, that on the surface of it, just that the scores mean something that they're meaningful um, to be able to uh, use in some practical manner. A little bit more about reliability. So internal consistency. So for scales, let's say it's a, a physical function scale. Like I'll keep using rotator cuff disease as an example, as the example. If all the items are proposed to be measuring the same underlying construct, um, they should uh, uh, correlate with each other essentially. So they should relate to each other. That's internal consistency. Test retest reliability is the idea that repeated measurements yield similar results in similar individuals. Inter-rater reliability is that separate observers have similar results, say, uh, measuring the same patient. Um, Intra-rater reliability is the same observer. So in this case, say the patient does it on day zero, they've had no intervention, and on day 14, they redo it. It should be highly correlated, like a p-value 0.7 or more. And then measurement error. This is the amount of disagreement with essentially the precision associated with the instrument. So the classes of validity, content, construct, and criterion, this is kind of the classical way of, of uh, describing uh, the 
characteristics under classical test theory. I had a response theory is something that I don't talk a lot about in this, but um, remind me to say something about it, or somebody, somebody please ask me a question about it. Um, <clears throat> content validity is the extent to which the domain of interest is comprehensively sampled by the items in the questionnaire. So if we're measuring physical function of the person, it's, you know, and we're, we're talking about the rotator cuff, it's any activity that you require your, you know, say your, your left rotator cuff to be able to do. Maybe it's combing your hair, or brushing your teeth, or it's doing the laundry, etc. Face validity is that the items appear to, on the surface, by anybody who's rational and logical, appear to measure what they propose to. So it just makes sense, the wording. Construct validity is the extent to which the scores on a particular questionnaire relate to other measures of similar domains. So there's a bunch of physical function measures for the upper extremity. So the um, you know, measure A should relate to measure B if they both propose to uh, measure physical function. Criterion validity is the extent to which the scores on a particular questionnaire relate to some gold standard. So say it's <clears throat> physical function of the shoulder and we use range of motion tests as an example as the criterion, some external criterion. And the responsiveness is the ability to detect clinically important changes over time. Many of you may have heard of the concept of the minimally important difference, sometimes called the minimally clinically important difference. This is the smallest change in the score that patients deem to be relevant or meaningful to them. So it could be improvement. So let's say it's a pain scale and the pain scale is from zero to 10. It looks like the minimally important difference is fairly similar on the pain scale across samples. It varies a little bit, but it's usually around 20% or two points. So if they go up by two points, that's a meaningful change. If they go down by two points, that's also a meaningful change. So this is a nice um, uh, rule of thumb to be able to judge whether or not the patients are improving in some meaningful manner. You know, a, a point and a half or less is, is, is probably not important to uh, patients. Of course, it depends on the area. These are some books on measurement properties. I wanted to show them here. I also show them at the end, as well as some other resources um, for those who are interested. These are all excellent textbooks. Um, they're published through a variety of years. There's some of these I used when I was in graduate school. This is a new edition of it, um, the Striner book. Um, the DeVette book is relatively new, and the uh, Capillary book is relatively new as well, too. They're all excellent and complementary to each other. You know, um, I would say if you're quite interested, just uh, scoop them, scoop them all up so you have them in their library in your library. When you're choosing puros, first look for. Okay, let me back up. So, you have some whether you're doing a clinical trial or whether you want to monitor patients in whatever area you're working in. You need to make some choices because there's a lot of outcome measures out there. For, you know, for rotator cuff disease, we've, I've done many systematic reviews on the properties of, of PROs in a variety of areas. And for rotator cuff disease, I think um, when we first did this in 2015, I think there was 32 or 34 outcome measures that were proposed to be used for rotator cuff disease. It's unbelievable that are specific for rotator cuff disease. Um, so these aren't generic health related quality of life measures. So how do you choose? The first thing to do is to look for a core outcome set. So a core outcome set is the minimal set of outcome measures that should be or that are recommended to be used in clinical trials and or in patient care. So this whole concept of core outcome sets started to become popular maybe five, eight years ago. So there's this group called the Comet Group, um, Core Outcome Set Measurement. Um, I don't remember what the E is and in trials group in the UK to check out their database. They have a searchable database of core outcome sets that have been completed um, for a whole variety of areas. You know, there's one for shoulder pain, there's one for total knee arthroplasty, there's one for depression, etc. cetera. Um, so look if there's a core outcome set first, because then that's pretty easy. Because usually the case for if folks do core outcome set development and they follow the current guidance, which is either the Comet group or the OMORACT group, which I show here, there's the OMRAC website. OMRAC is Outcome Measures in Rheumatology, um, uh, but it's actually gone beyond that to all kinds of different types of musculoskeletal and health related quality of life uh, measures. Um, what they do is they go through a really rigorous process. First do a search, or excuse me, first do a, um, uh, a set of consensus meetings with patients, clinicians, and scientists, et cetera, about you know, what are necessary domains to uh, measure, um, do some Delphi processes, have some in-group focus meetings, look at the empirical evidence, 
um, that's out there, then do a systematic review uh, of those domains that they found to find instruments that, that, that measure these things well. And that's how the outcome sets are built. If you can't find a core outcome set, you can just look for systematic reviews of patient reported outcome measures to help you choose which ones are measuring the domains that you want to measure and that have good properties, have good validity, reliability, responsiveness, and interpretability. Um, this is a really nice website, the Cosme website. Um, the Cosme website is a group from the Netherlands. Um, Cosme was started by uh, Carolyn Turi and uh, Lidwin uh, Mokink um, from the University of Amsterdam. And they're both, uh, they're both clinical epidemiologists, fairly certain. Um, but there's some cross training there as well too, but um, they have a very nice database of systematic reviews that have been done for PROs and it's fairly regularly updated. Of course, you could search Medline as well too for systematic reviews of patient reported outcome measures in rotator cuff disease or rotator cuff tears, for example. Um, if you can't find a systematic review, you do your, you can do your own systematic review using some guidance from the Cosmin group on the Cosmin website. I'm going to show you some of these. This is where you go out just like a systematic review in any other area of some intervention. You do a systematic review here of the PROs that are being used. You look for studies that have tested the validity and reliability and responsiveness of a particular uh, PROs for a particular, say, disease area. And then you do an assessment of it. You assess the risk of bias of the study. You assess the the, the, the quality of the evidence, and then you combine those together to synthesize it, and you get an overall um, um, appraisal of what the um, uh, PRO, the evidence for these PROs look like. There's often gaps, uh, but usually you can isolate ones that are that are looking pretty good. Of course, if you need to balance, you know, in some cases, the ones that are good aren't measuring exactly what you want to measure, so you really have to sort of balance the, the, the um, uh, your, your view of the overall quality of the evidence for the pros with those that are practically necessary for the question that you're asking. If you can't find systematic reviews, you can do your own original measurement research. There's a lot that needs to be done. These are interesting areas to do. They can be built into existing observational studies or clinical trials as little methods pieces. Um, I've been funded on them um, through a variety of organizations, so they are fundable. Um, or you can develop, as a last case scenario, you can develop a new measure. I don't really recommend it. It takes a lot of time because um, you need to go through some pretty rigorous processes, whether or not you use classical test theory or item response theory. Um, um, I don't certainly don't recommend it because there's so many out there. But it could be the case that you have this unique situation where you need a new PLO. I'm not going through this whole slide. I just want to show you it. Here's the citation down here at the bottom. ISA Quality International Society of Quality of Life. They set out a, a, set, uh, a published uh, a set of standards um, for PROs used in patient-centered outcomes research or comparative effective research. This is kind of like a key for to help you choose what type of measure you should be using for your particular question. So take a look at this. I'm not, again, I'm not going through all this. I wanted to make you aware of some material that you can use on your own when, when, when making some choices. So, if you need to do a systematic review of the evidence for PROMS, first of all, there's many of them out there. Um, and what they almost all uniformly state is, is that most PROs have poor or unknown evidence for their properties. They have to be used with caution, additional research is needed. There are too many PROs and a small selection are uh, quite good though. So it's not all kind of doom and gloom here. Um, the, the challenge is, is that there's just, in most cases, um, there's just not evidence for the peer, peer, all PROs that you're particularly, maybe particularly interested in. So more work needs to be done on that. It doesn't mean they're bad necessarily. It just means we don't, we don't know what to say in some cases if they have tested test reliability. When you're assessing measurement properties, there's, there's a lot of publications testing these measures. Um, so this is, you know, the, I'm talking about the primary studies that, you know, takes a sample of patients with rotator cuff disease gives them the Western Ontario Rotator Cuff Index and, and gives them another measure like the AASAS that I mentioned earlier and sees how um, they co-vary together to establish uh, you know, some type of criterion or content validity associated that does test through test reliability as well, say. So these are you know, called psychometric investigations or, or health measurement investigations or PROs. 
So they have to be done well with methodologic vigor. They have to be valid, of course, and they have to demonstrate to what extent the instrument has a particular property. So we have to assess, if you want to do a systematic review on these things, you got to assess papers and their properties. Um, only then do you know if an instrument actually has adequate measurement properties. So there's two proposed methods of going about performing a, the assessments of um, a body of evidence for a particular PRO. There's something called the MPRO, which is the Evaluating Measures of Patient Reported Outcomes Tool. And then there's the COSMIN group, consensus-based standards for the selection of health measurement instruments, which gives a lot of guidance on this as well, too. Both are great. I'm going to just overview both of them here for you to see. So MPRO was designed to measure the quality of peer, you know, patient for outcome measures. It has eight attributes and 39 items, just like you would apply a checklist for a randomized control trial to assess its risk of bias. It's the same sort of deal, except this one also includes sort of the, the magnitude of evidence, like maybe closer to the grade criteria if anybody's ever heard of that. So you assess the developmental process, how the instrument performs, so all the measurement properties, reliability, responses, et cetera. And then they get an overall rating. And you can also get a rating of administrative issues. So what's the burden associated with the instruments? Is there alternative modes of administration? Um, do you need um, some cross-cultural validity? Um, are there linguistic adapt uh, adaptations that you require, for example? And then they're measured on the Likert scale. And um, they get an overall assessment. It's a combination of the property and the quality of the study in a judgment. And the comments are given by readers to, like I said, to verify the uh, ratings. Here's the uh, MPRO, the main uh, publication for this. Take a look at it. They also have a nice website with uh, all of the info. The second one I'll talk about is the Cosmic Checklist. So the Cosmic Checklist is technically a risk of bias assessment. So just like, again, you need to do risk of bias assessment of a randomized control trial, or you need to do risk of bias assessment of a um, cohort study, if you're doing a systematic review in some area, the same deal here. So the COSMIC group came up with a set of criteria to assess the risk of bias of studies that measure, measure measurement properties or psychometric properties. So and the measurement properties are assessed include this whole list here. Here's the primary publication. And basically there's a set of criteria that you go through. I think I'm gonna show an example, uh, oh no, but I'll talk about it a little bit more later. The, there's a set of criteria within each of these properties that you need to go through. So if a study says that it's proposing to assess internal consistency of the Western Ontario Rotator Cuff Index, there's a set of criteria questions you need to go through to see if it did it well, if it did it properly. If it didn't, then you can't trust the results, so it's not valid. Next, there's a set of criteria also, also by the Cosmo Group, Carolyn Turwee. These are called, called, we kind of call them the Turwee criteria. What they are, what these do, they don't assess the risk of bias in these studies. They assess the magnitude of the evidence or the psychometric evidence. So again, it goes by each property. So reliability, it gives some cutoffs. You know, if it had a Cronbox alpha greater than uh, 7.0, then it did good. It had good internal consistency. If it didn't have uh, a Cronbox alpha of greater than 0 0.70, then it had poor internal consistency. So it was poor on that property. So it gives you a set of criteria to be able to assess the, the quality of the um, psychometric evidence for each property. So now we have the risk of bias of all the, prop, of all the papers that assess particular properties. And then we have the, the sort of magnitude um, um, of the psychometric evidence. So how good they are. And we can combine these together using the uh, Schillinger criteria which gives strong, moderate, limit, limited, conflicting, and unknown ratings. Again, here's a citation for that. Take a look at it. This is the common method that's been used. Um, recently, there's been some updates to for how we do systematic reviews, but this is still the sort of go-to method for doing systematic reviews of PROs. Um, there's updated guidance for uh, performing systematic reviews of PROMs here, um, uh, published a couple of years ago, again, by the, uh, the Cosman Group. And Cosmin, um, the Cosmin website, Cosmin.nl, has some guidelines for conducting systematic reviews of outcome measures that are basically updates of all of the stuff I just showed you, of the Cosmin checklist, of the Turi criteria, and of the Schillinger out um, criteria to then combine all your information together to get an overall rating. 
So take a look at it if you're interested in, in doing these. These are great studies. They're highly publishable. I've published them all the great, the, all the best journals in, in my field. Um, so uh, they're, you know, it's, uh, um, and they have, they have good impact, strong impact on your, on your relative fields. Now, how do PROMs contribute to clinical practice and clinical applications? So suffice it to say, if we went through all that stuff that I've already talked about, we've been able to identify you know, some good pros that we want to use either for our clinical research or for, you know, application to, um, uh, to help the patients that are coming into our clinics. So, of course, there's been some groups over in the UK that have looked at this a fair bit. I'm kind of summarizing globally the evidence in the area. It looks like, um, you know, PROs can, of course, support decision making in the diagnostic process, either for screening or in, or in the actual diagnosis. They can inform risk stratification and prognosis. So identify those that are, you know, vulnerable patients or patients at risk. Support prior prioritization and goal setting. You know, decision share decision making between the patient and the clinician. Um, of course, they support can support decision making for indication of treatment or the response to a treatment. And like I said already, facilitate communication between patients and healthcare professionals within teams between professionals, etc. So there's a lot of uses. I think. Well, you probably have intuited this. Now, what is the evidence of the effect of PROs on patient outcomes? So PROs themselves are patient outcomes, but maybe, you know, how do they, um, um, how do they relate to other, um, uh, other aspects other than physical function, psychological health, social health um, that are reported by the patients themselves? You know, things that we can maybe objectively measure or are other aspects of of um, social interaction. So there's some evidence that PROMs improve shared decision-making, improve communication, improve outcomes in patients, and improve survival. But there's hardly any research in this area. And it, it is astounding that uh, there's, there's so little. There really needs to be some more work done on in, in areas that have implemented, implemented PROs for a period of time and compare them to prior to that. And in fact, we're planning just such a study in orthopedic surgery. We, about how many years ago, I guess about four years ago now, we implemented PROs across several of our services. And um, we can now, we can measure, you know, if the PROs are being used in clinical decision making, in a lot of cases they are, um, we can measure how that maybe could influence, say, for total joint replacement, influences the number of patients um, that come in for revision at one year. Um, we should be able to find out if it's having some impact on, on patient care. So more research is really needed. Please do some work in this area. When you're delivering pros in, in the clinic, you have some choices to make. Almost uniformly, I put paper-based up, up here because there's still a lot of groups that like using paper-based forms. It's people that just like filling it out, filling it out on a sheet. More often is the case that they're given an iPad or given you know, some sort of tablet or that they're getting an email with a link through the portal or an email through REDCap or something to be able to fill it out electronically. The beauty with um, the electronic uh, format is, is that you can give static tests or computerized adaptive testing. And I'll explain that. So a static test is a test that a person has to answer every single question. A computerized adaptive test is a test that is adaptive to the question, the answers to prior questions. So a patient reported outcome, um, patient reported outcome measurement information system with the promise instruments are almost all, there's some that you can use statically, but they're almost all computerized adaptive tests. So what happens is the person answers the first question and whatever their answer is there dictates which next question they get. So what it does is tries to minimize the variation associated with the construct that's being measured to minimize the amount of questions that need to be asked. So you have a, a test that measures that's, we'll use the rotator cuff again, but measures physical function of the rotator cuff and it has 35 questions. Instead of the patient having to fill out all 35, they only have to fill out 12 or even eight. And they're just as valid and just as reliable as if they filled out all of the questions. So, and that's where item response theory comes in. Item response theory is kind of modern, um, uh, modern psychometric theory that uses different methods of development, but the, but the, the, sort of the, re, the, re, the results that come out of item response theory development of tests are used to make computerized adaptive tests. 
So they're really handy, they shorten the time, the burden on the patients, uh, but of course they need to be delivered electronically. Of course, electronic collection makes integration into practice easier, builds in the prom, you can build in any prom that you want of interest. Um, you might have to adapt the integration of problems into the clinical workflows, of course. Um, you have to protect patient time to complete them. Are they going to complete them in a waiting room? Are they going to complete them at home? Is it necessary that they complete them in the clinic? Maybe they can complete them at home. Does it need to be within a week of a procedure? All these things matter. Um, so you need individuals that are that have a you know kind of a, a stake in the game to be able to um, to be able to um, help make sure that you're delivering these things in the right way to your patients. And you must dedicate a team to follow up patients, of course. So there's some electronic collection tools. The you know RHR um, um, is um, um, useful for it. Um, we can build PROs into Epic. Um, we've done that already. Some people prefer not to do it because it's a little bit labor intensive. But we do have a very good um, you know my chart um, Epic uh, development research development team that will help build PROs right in there for you. And then they can be displayed within the chart electronically. Some people like using other third-party software, like things like REDCap or the Promise Assessment Center. REDCap is usually used as a research tool, but you can use it um, for monitoring patients as well too. Uh, as well too. Um, you can write in any pros that you want, any underlying commands for computer adaptive testing, and they can be delivered to patients electronically. They can be pinged electronically. They can be texted, they can be emailed. Um, so super useful. We use REDCap for, we currently use REDCap for our shoulder registry. Um, so it's really handy that way. But you still must determine which pros you use, when to repeat them, how to interpret them, and how to display them or integrate them into the charts to aid in clinical decision making. And a lot of this stuff, we don't know exactly what the answers are just yet, but we're working on it. Of course, you can use apps. Um, Dr. Joel Morat, who's an orthopedic surgeon, total joint surgeon here at University of Michigan, he's now moved. Uh, but uh, he developed, and I helped him with this, develop an app to, um, that, to use PROs to measure things like pain, um, even um, you know, um, uh, correlating this with uh, with step counts like distance walked, etc. Um, so there are some tools out there. Take a look at there's a variety of apps that are available. Um, um, but if you wanted to build one, there's lots of folks who can uh, help with that. I can point you them here at the university. So in the end, um, obviously, pros or proms have an obvious place in clinical research and healthcare. Of course, they reflect the constructs and important to patients. They uh, these measures are our are, are, are key component to clinical care across the health system. This is a quote from a paper that I wrote um, with proper choice of primes, the use of innovative information technology to deliver them and thoughtful use of the data to improve communication, audit inter intervention effectiveness, and thus help with decision-making concerning a patient's care. Primes can aid in the value assessment of healthcare interventions and save considerable resources. And that's it. Here's a set of resources with those same papers and uh, yeah, a link to PCORI and uh, one of uh, my papers in, in orthopedic surgery. Thanks very much. Thanks, Joel. Thank you for that. Um, that was a really interesting presentation. I learned, I, I took some notes so I can <laughs> make sure to follow up with some of the references that you provided. Um, we had a couple questions come through in the chat. So let me ask those and folks on the call, if you have other questions, please feel free to put them in the chat or um, we might even have time to unmute and you can ask the questions yourself. But let me ask the first one here. Um, how to improve follow-up and how to publish when follow-up rate is low. It seems the data are still meaningful even if it's hard to get. Sort of your thoughts on since- yeah. Pros, you know, require people to actually respond. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So follow up within, I'm assuming within like some sort of clinical research is where the question is coming from. Um, so, yeah. Okay. yeah, so it's a problem. It, well, it can be a problem. So what, I'll give you two examples of how, we, how I'll give you an example of how we solved it and how some colleagues in my Cleveland Clinic solved it. So we, um, we had really poor follow-up. So we switched from paper collection in our, in our shoulder registry, which included, let me think, or still includes one, two, three PROs and then a couple global measures. So it's not a whole lot of questions. I think it's around 60, 70 questions. 
collected at baseline um, at six months and then every year thereafter um, following the repair of the rotator cuff, uh, rotator cuff tears. So the follow-up was really bad at first, even though they were being pinged electronically. So what we had to do was send personalized, either personalized emails that started to improve responses to the, the PRO collection, um, have them complete them in clinic, um, is another, was another uh, way to resolve that. And then third, call them. Um, uh, well, and there's one more as well too. So calling folks, so we had to have, I had, we had two dedicated um, research assistants that basically all they did once a week was call patients to, to, to remind them to fill out the PRO, to remind them how important it was to improving care, um, to informing decision-making, et cetera. The fourth way was to provide an incentive. <laughs> so, and the incentive um, that we provided uh, was fairly nominal, I'd say. Um, after the, uh, we also performed a cohort study. Um, so for the registry, we don't provide an incentive, but for the cohort study we did and so we, we had offered, and we, there was more follow-ups there. There was follow-ups, um, let me think now, there was follow-ups pre-surgical, um, immediately post-surgical, and then essentially every four weeks after that, right up to a year. For that one, we gave patients a, a little monetary incentive. So monetary incentives do work. The evidence is kind of um unclear about what level of monetary incentive is necessary for how many follow-ups um it looks like anything more than five dollars kind of has diminishing returns so don't give start giving people a hundred or five hundred dollars to fill with questionnaires because it probably won't make any difference compared to five dollars um, then the um kind of a repeat of a little bit of what i said already what we did here at michigan was that cleveland clinic actually hired a whole team of very um, um, uh, very personable, sociable individuals to just be on the phone essentially all day um, reminding people to fill these things out. Of course, they were doing it across an entire department and ours was just one service for one, um, one condition. But those are a few ways. Yeah, um, I know we've struggled in my team with um, using all of those. So it's interesting to hear um, your perspective. You know, you try to personalize, you try the incentives and exactly um, what you said. We're not sure what amount, but some amount is often helpful. There was a follow-up to that too, how to publish that if you have this loss to follow-up. You know, that, that, that's, a, that's a really good question and it depends on how much loss to follow-up you have. So there's some rules of thumb, you know, rule of thumb is like if it's somewhere between some people say 15%, some people say 20% um, loss to follow up. In, in those cases, then you have to be really careful about how you're interpreting the data. Yeah, but, I think that was part of the question too. Is it yeah, meaningful? so it's, it's, and of course any reviewer is gonna see that, right. but there are imputation methods for missing data. There's a whole variety of imputation methods that can be used to help to fill in the gaps. Um, maybe you can't fill them up, get all of them in, but maybe you can get sort of below that, um, you know, 15% level or 20% level. Um, so maybe you get a little more of the 10% zone. So it, it looks a lot better that way. So really think about, we have, a, we have one of the world's best biostats departments. Um, and there are folks there that are excellent at these things. In fact, some of the imputation methods were, were developed right here at the University of Michigan. So get a hold of somebody, somebody there or I can refer you over. Um, well, this conversation spawned a few more questions. So um, <laughs> let's get to them. I think I'm gonna go, and you can probably see the chat now. I think if you, um, can you, Joe? Joel? Oh yeah, I can, I can, I can, so okay. I'm maybe, um, Joe is following up on that question, Joe Evans, with um, the question there about um, my chart keepers. I don't know if you have anything to comment there, but then we'll kind of go back up uh, to the questions. Oh, yeah. So um, following on the issue of poor response rates, is there anyone uh, on that can talk to the my chart keepers to turn on the welcome module mm -hmm. so that we can have tablets in the clinic? Uh, for patients to fill up uh, pros in my chart. I don't have a direct answer to that. I know who who was dealing with this about a year ago. Um, I don't know if they still are um, for the welcome. Um, so yeah. yeah, for the tablets. And, I, and one of the problems with, with that was that you couldn't use 
a Mac based uh, hard or software um, to deliver it. I'm not sure if they would resolve that problem or not. Um, because we had, you know, we got like <laughs> dozen Macs that we want to use, you know, we'll have to buy a bunch of other tablets. Um, so, um, Joe, send me an email and I'll see if I can uh, connect you with the uh, folks. Cool. Um, let's pop back up to uh, Roshan uh, asks, could you please talk about orthopedic surgeons receptivity toward pros? Do they routinely use pros to improve outcomes, surgical skills, any resistance to using pros to measure surgical quality? That's a great question. Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I have to say, I have to say no. I mean, I've been uh, generally no, there hasn't been resistance. Um, the receptivity has been very good. Um, I've been in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery here since 2010. And in that time, I can't recall a single um, sort of, you know, uh, consistent resistance against using PROs for collection in, in the clinic or for research. What's more routinely done is that they're collected sort of set up kind of registry like, and the data is warehoused until there's enough data there to ask some questions about, you know, did surgical procedure A or timing of antibiotic B, uh, you know, help with their, the, the patient's pain at you know, 12 weeks. Um, so more frequently that sort of thing is being done. We had a top down uh, push, as I said, to collect PROs across the services and most services have, have done that and are doing that. Um, we don't have a good sense of how much the, say the changes in pros are being discussed for the patients and how much they're being used for decision-making changes. We don't have a good sense of that just yet. Um, and uh, yeah, so there hasn't been, you know, there hasn't been any resistance really. And, and someone else had a similar question. Um, Yome uh, had a similar question. So I think that you kind of address that. Um, okay. Another question that came in uh, from Lisa, do you have any general observations as to how long of an instrument is too burdensome and how is burden assessed? That's an interesting question as well. What are your thoughts? Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a really good question. Most commonly burden is assessed simply by the time it takes to complete the instrument. Um, and, you know, it, it, it looks like if you go over about like, seven, nine minutes, uh, folks start losing attention <laughs> to completing yeah. the measures. It depends on the area, it depends on the question that you're, 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 you're asking or excuse me, the construct you're trying to measure. Um, and, and um, you know, it's, it's interesting and it depends on the, it really depends on the setting with, with, with patients. It, it's, uh, it's about the patient group really. Um, so, and then, and then also it appears, you know, of course, how you set up the need to collect this information. So the conversation, the pre-conversation that's had, if it's in the context of clinical care, explaining why they're filling out, uh, what, it, what it all means, you know, of course, that is confidential, it's in their chart, um, that, that they'll be able to fill it out again in the future, or they'll be able to review it with their, you know, um, with, their, with their PA, with their physician, whatever. Um, giving them a, a really good context of why it's potentially important to complete. And it looks like that really helps with, uh, with completing the PROs. So yeah, it's usually assessed by time. Um, that's, yeah, that's basically how it's done. <laughs> yeah, um, that relates to another question that had come in earlier before the talk, um, which a little bit, which asks about which PROMs are not well-suited for self-administration via mobile phone. It, it kind of gets to this, in, issue of burden a little bit, I think. So do you have any thoughts about kind of the mobile um, platform for assessment? And is it different in terms of burden or specific instruments that work or don't work? Um, it, so it, it does, it, again, it depends on, it depends on the area. So, um, and on the patient population. So we had an issue um, and this has been published where um, the patient group should dictate the, the, the delivery method and platform that you're using. So we uh, were assessing patients for uh, particular disease within um, orthopedics where it's almost primarily in the, in the elderly, like we're talking like over 70. Um, and we were handing them an iPad. 
so a standard iPad, and they're having a real problem navigating the iPad, just manually navigating it. And so we had to switch over to a, a larger screen, a larger screen um, type tablet, or use a um, larger screen desktop uh, with a mouse that was a little easier. And even in some cases, we had to print the forms to have them fill them out um, in paper-based form and then, and then and then input them. One of our areas would input them. So I mean that's kind of that, that that's kind of one of the common things that's been shown. Um, the the other is is that um, sometimes with mobile platforms, so if it's like via an app, um, there could be losses of information. Um, so if it's not correctly uploaded to uh, a server, or if it's only partially filled out because somebody's doing four or five things at a time and um, they're not completing all the questions, so you end up having more mis missing data. Um, that's been showing up in the uh, literature a bit too. So it's, yeah, it's sort of a combination of uh, the measure, the length, the burden, the person's facility with um, mobile types of platforms. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think I, I kind of glossed over a little part of one of the questions above that might be an interesting way to kind of end out with, which is, um, you, you know, you talked about surgeons receptivity towards pros, but um, Yomei was asking more too about um, the healthcare uh, providers confidence in discussing them with patients. And I had, I kind of hadn't seen that part. What are your thoughts on, um, do you have any recommendations or strategies for um, how healthcare providers can take them and kind of discuss in the clinical consult, the results of a pro assessment with patients? Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I do. Um... And there's there's starting to be a nice nice little body of literature in this area. Um, firstly, it's you know the first the, the first step of course is, is is training the clinicians on the interpretation of the, the scores. So what does the change in score mean for a particular patient? Um, is it of a magnitude that's important? On what is or are there? Um, so there could be a, a set of questions that measure um, an individual domain, like pain, or there could be a set of questions that measure multiple domains, like pain while walking, you know, pain while sitting, pain while sleeping, et cetera. So um, um, certainly identifying which of the domains or which of the construct is the most important um, for the patient um, that they're most interested in improving, um, showing them sort of linear progress um, across time um, with the surgeon sort of uh, identifying, usually with color-coded graphing is nice um, about how um, the scores are, are, are changing for a person and if that's sort of meaningful change across time. And then at important points where interventions um, had occurred, all of those things can help with um, um, allowing the physician to interpret the, the, the scores appropriately, finding out what's most important to the patient and allowing the patient to then see the, uh, the benefit of the, the treatment that they're, they're going through. Yeah, that's, um, I, I think about that too, just in terms of the communication and kind of how can pros and pro assessments be used to kind of promote shared decision-making or yeah. better, better patient physician communication and decision. I do really think there needs to be more training um, yeah, on, on the use of pros um, with, uh, with clinicians, given that very soon everybody's going to be collecting something on every patient. Um, right. So yeah, some, some concerted training and it's uh, something that we're sort of working on planning on uh, putting in an R01 for something along these lines associated with K24 in the near future. Oh, great. Well, we'll I'll, I'll love to talk to you about that more. That'd be awesome. Yeah, I could use the feedback on it. Well, we're just about up till five o'clock. Oh, then yeah, okay. Any more questions. I, that was a great, um, you, you uh, prompted a lot of questions and interests. Um, so thank you, Joel. We will, um, hang out if people are interested. Um, Stacy will start putting people in some small groups for a few minutes. Um, so we'll see how that goes. But thank you, uh, Joel, for your excellent presentation and question and answer session.
thanks very much for having me and I really appreciate the questions everybody reach out if you uh, you know want to connect or you need some help with something great bye now. bye bye bye